Colossians in your Bible, Colossians chapter 1, and uh, we're looking at verses 24 through 29. And uh, just by way of review here shortly, we remember that uh, Paul is writing this epistle to the church in Colossae. Colossae was a small town about 100 miles inland of Ephesus, which was a big port city, a lot of trade, a lot of things going on in Asia Minor in that time. And so this was a small town. I've said every Sunday as we go through this, it always reminds me in comparison that this was almost Colossae was like Newtown in regards to New York City between Ephesus and Colossae, the same distance and the same small town feel that we enjoy in our community. Very much is what Colossae enjoyed when you study history and read the scriptures. It was a new church, five years old at the time of this writing. It was a church plant and uh, a man who... Paul led to the Lord back in Ephesus, got on trusted Christ, got on fire for the Lord, went back to his small town of Colossae, and through the Holy Spirit, planted this church. But now as we read, and you remember as we've gone through it, there is starting to creep into the church false doctrine and false teaching. And they're starting to take the emphasis off of Christ, and that Jesus was not God, he was another man, he was, a, he was just a spirit, and that the angels and, and witchcraft and all these things were how we can mediate between God. And so this man, Epaphras, who helped start this church is very concerned that this false doctrine will trip up new believers. And by the way, can I say we're a new church. We're just two years old. But I say often, and I'll say again this morning, that your doctrine determines your destiny. What you believe will determine how your life will end up. And so that is why it's so important. Number one, you want to keep Christ the center. But number two, you want to get it right when it comes to Scripture. You want to know your Bible. You want to not get, as the Bible says, thrown off by every wind of doctrine. And so it's important to understand what the Bible teaches, what the doctrines of the Bible are, and to make sure that we're as close to Scripture as we can be. And anybody who tells you that Jesus is not God and that the Bible is not the ultimate authority, that should be an antenna to, to watch out. We should know Scripture and study it for ourselves so that we're not just thrown off by a TV preacher or a social media preacher or someone we hear on the radio or a book we read. We don't want to just go off in a wrong teaching or a wrong doctrine just because it sounded good or it was a, it was a cool video. We want to know what God's word says and stick to it. And so Paul, who is burdened, writes this letter to this church of Colossae and he encourages them. And really the whole theme of it is the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. It's all about Christ. And so he combats the false teaching and we've gone through that. Five weeks ago we covered verse 1 through 14 and we saw Paul's prayer for the people in Colossae. Four weeks ago... We focus on the supremacy, the sovereignty, and the sufficiency of Christ in our lives. Three weeks ago, verse 18 through 22, we were reminded that Christ is the head of the church. It's only through the work of Christ on the cross that we can have reconciliation with God our creator. And that Jesus Christ is the source of peace and purpose in your life. If you're here this morning and you have no peace in your life and you have no purpose in your life, I would implore you to give the Word of God, a try, and not a try, I don't like to use that word, but a chance in your life. Pursue God. Draw nigh to God. The Bible says He will draw nigh to you. Christ is the ultimate source of peace and purpose. Two weeks ago, before Mother's Day, we looked at verse 23 and studied what it means to have Christ as the foundation of our life. And now this morning, we're going to jump into verse 24, and I want you just to follow along, skip, uh, stay with me as we go through these verses, all right? We're going to break down the context, we're going to peel back some layers, and then at the end, we're going to bring it all together. So stick with me as we go through it. Ready? Verse 24. Paul says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Paul is emphasizing his sufferings, the sufferings that he faced in his life. Writing from a Roman, he's in Rome at this time, he's, he's under house arrest, and he declares that even though he's been arrested for his faith and for preaching the gospel, he can still rejoice under hardship. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we find in the life of a believer, we see someone who's struggling, and they're going through something, and we look at them and say, well, 
They still have peace or they still can find joy in their life. Why, why is that? It's because Christ is the anchor. Why or how could Paul rejoice in his sufferings? Well, he answers that question here in Colossians 1. Verse 24, he says he can rejoice because he was suffering because of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3, if you're familiar, says, talks about the fellowship of his sufferings. Remember in 1 Peter, when we were going through that, we looked at the truth and we drew that application that as a Christian, it is an honor to suffer for Christ. There is a special blessing and reward reserved for the faithful believer who suffers for the sake of Christ. There is a crown in heaven for those martyrs throughout history that have died for their faith. For Christians who have not denounced their faith and hardship, but have stood for the gospel of Jesus Christ and have faced suffering and persecution for it, it is a joy to suffer for Jesus Christ. The least that we can do is live our life and sell out to Christ. And if it comes to it, sacrifice for him. So Paul, why could he rejoice in his sufferings? Verse 24, again, stick with me. We're going somewhere. He was suffering because of Jesus Christ. Number two, he was suffering because of the Gentiles. He was suffering because of the Gentiles. See, Paul was chosen as the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter, in Scripture, was the apostle to the Jews. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He was arrested in Jerusalem on false charges. And the Jews listened to his defense. And while the Jews listened to his defense, he brought up the Gentiles and how Christianity, the gospel, is not just for the Jew, but it is for the Hebrew, it is for the Greek, it is for the Gentile. And you read the book of Acts, they wanted him executed. And so why is Paul suffering for Christ? He's suffering because he's bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. And the Jewish leaders believe it's just for the Jewish people. And so these people in Colossae, by the way, they were not of Jewish descent. They were Gentiles. So they had every reason to be thankful for Paul's suffering. Also, number three, he was suffering for the sake of Christ's church. It's interesting when you read Paul, you know that he was once in the Bible known as Saul. And Saul, in Scripture, before he was converted to Christ, would go out and persecute Christians. In fact, he was on the road to Damascus in Acts, and he was on his way to persecute Christians. The very first deacon in the church in history was by, the, by a, man, a man by the name of Stephen. And you read the book of Acts, Stephen was stoned to death for his faith. And Paul, who before was known as Saul, was there as Peter was stoned. He would kill Christians. He would destroy the churches. He was an enemy of the church. Yet now, as converted, it's amazing the contrast, as now he has put his faith in Christ, he is suffering for the sake of Christ's church. Now again, just a side thought there. You look at a Saul and you say, he will never come to Christ. He's persecuting believers. He's an evil man. He's wicked. He's hopeless. He's a lost cause. Yet, God changed his life. And again, to apply to all of us here this morning, you look at someone in your life and say, they're never going to come to Christ. They have so much baggage and so much guilt, and they seem far away from Christ. Maybe they were once with Christ, and they've, they've wandered off. Can I remind you, nothing's impossible with Jesus Christ. He can bring the one back in the fold of the 99. He seeks out. And if you're here this morning and, and maybe that thought is for you, can I, can I encourage you? The reason you're here this morning is because the love of God is chasing you and wants to work in your life. And so Paul suffered for the sake of Christ's church. The sufferings that Paul endured had nothing to do, by the way, and this is getting a little heavy for a moment, but sometimes you'll hear preachers or teachers, they'll take these verses and they'll twist the doctrine and the teaching and the understanding of it. The sufferings that Paul endured had nothing to do with the sacrificial sufferings of Christ on the cross. There is one gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the gospel of Paul and then the gospel of Jesus. There is one gospel. And Paul is not saying that his sufferings was equal with the sufferings of Christ on the cross. Scripture clearly tells us that only the sinless Lamb of God could die for the sins of the world. In fact, if you read verse 24, he says, The afflictions of Christ in my flesh... Afflictions in that verse, it means the pressures of life. He's talking about the persecutions that he endured. The sacrificial sufferings of Christ are over, but his body, us, the church, will experience sufferings because of our stand of the faith. And that's what Paul is talking about, and I think it's important. We won't get into depth of that this morning. It's more of a Bible study, but to at least hit that. 
Paul was taking his turn and sharing these afflictions and teachings, the Colossian people, and teaching the Colossian people to do the same, to stand for their faith and not be ashamed. Now look at verse 25, and, and we're plugging along here. He says, Whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word. Referring to the church, Paul refers to himself, notice that word, as a minister. In the Greek, that word can be translated a servant. Paul is telling the people in Colossae he was a servant of the gospel and of the church. Both were important parts of his ministry. Paul then shares how he came to be a servant. He says he was, God entrusted this to him. God called this to him. And also that word dispensation in that verse, it means a steward. God called Paul to be a steward of the gospel. And by the way, Christian, if you're a believer of Jesus Christ, God has called us through the Great Commission to be a good steward of the gospel. A steward is someone charged with care until the master returns for his property. Can I remind you that everything in this world is God's? God is that we are, we are not our own. It's not, oh, it's, it's, it's I want to do what I want to do. It's my life. No, we are God's. God is in control of all of our life, of our time, of our talents, of our abilities, of our finances, of our, of our talents. All those things are the Lord's, and it is our job as Christians to be good stewards of what God has given us until the Master returned. Paul viewed his work as a part of God's plan for his life. It was not just his, for his own benefit, but he was out to serve other people. Verse 26, he says, Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Paul's special message regarding the Gentiles had to do, notice that phrase, what he called the mystery. Now today we hear that word and a mystery we think is something that's eerie or perhaps frightening, but this was not the way that the word was defined in Paul's day. The false teachers that were coming into the church of Colossae, they would use this word to describe the inner secrets of religion. A mystery is a sacred secret. It's hidden in the past, but now it's revealed by the Holy Spirit. And so I love Paul because he's taking these false teachers' terms and using them against him and saying, hey, you got the right word, but you have the wrong dictionary. And a lot of times in false teachers, that's what you'll, you'll hear. Go, that sounds good, but the definition is off. And that's what these false teachers were doing. And so Paul comes in and corrects. Now it's important to know this. Again, stick with me. I know so this is like we're in a classroom or a Bible study. Stick with me. We're going somewhere. God called the nation of Israel to be his people. And because of that, there's been conflict ever since. Just look at the news today. By the way, I think it's important we pray for Israel. God called the nation of Israel to be his people. He gave them his law, including the priesthood and sacrifices, and he gave them a wonderful land. He promised them a king who would one day establish a glorious kingdom and fulfill the many promises in the Old Testament that he made to Abraham and David. The Old Testament prophets wrote about a Messiah who would suffer and then a Messiah who would reign. But when Christ came, they couldn't understand or wrap their minds around the contradiction. They, they didn't understand that the Messiah first had to suffer before he could reign and enter into glory. They thought, the disciples thought, Jesus was coming to deliver them from the persecution of Rome to kick the emperor out and to reign and to save the Jewish people. But they couldn't wrap their mind around that God's plan was bigger. By the way, again, can I remind you, God's plan is always greater and bigger than what we understand. Well, it should go like this, and this is what should happen, and, and here's how things should come together. And God says, no, 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 just trust my sovereign hand. I'm at work. There's a big picture here that you can't see. Trust me. And that's what God was doing. Jesus came to earth. He was rejected by his people, the Israelites, the Jewish people. He was crucified. He rose again, and he returned to heaven. And so the Jewish people think, well, does this mean that God promised a kingdom from Israel, but now it was abandoned? No, because God, through grace and Calvary, had initiated a new program. His mystery was not explained by the Old Testament prophets. The mystery is that today, what's the mystery, Pastor Zach? Here's the mystery, ready? God is uniting Jews and Gentiles in the church. When the church is complete, Christ will return and take his people to heaven. And then we know in Scripture he will deal with the Israel, Israel as a nation and establish his promised 
kingdom. But the Jewish people, they did not like that the gospel, all of this, the Messiah was for everybody. And that's why they pushed back on Paul. Because Paul said the gospel is for the Jew, but also the Greek. And so imagine what this message meant to these Gentile people in Colossae. They were no longer excluded from the glory and riches of God's grace. During the Old Testament, you study for yourself, a Gentile had to become a Jewish proselyte in order to share in the blessings of Israel. But in the new dispensation, Jews and Gentiles are saved by faith in Jesus Christ, Romans 10, 12 through 13. And so that's why the Jewish leaders were so opposed to Paul when he said there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. They were opposed because they were holding on to their religion and their law. But again, the people in Colossae, as they hear this, they're celebrating, they're rejoicing. And by the way, we're rejoicing this morning that the gospel is for whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord. We can all be saved. We can all know Christ. And so that's the mystery that Paul is talking about in verse 26, okay? We're winding down in verses, verse 27. To whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So again, the mystery of Christ mentioned in the previous verse. It was both for Jews and Gentiles. In addition to the mystery, notice what he says. I love this, this phrase. To whom God would make known. Paul's noting God's sovereignty, which I referred to before, but it is perfect and all-encompassing knowledge and control. God would make it known in his timing. That's what Paul's saying. And in your life this morning, you're struggling, you're going through something, and you say, I just want God to work. Would you trust God? God is never late. He's always right on time. And then notice that phrase he says in verse 27, Christ in you. I love this because Paul makes the gospel message very personal to the believers in the church of Colossae. Christ lives in you. This is not a temple you have to go to and, 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 and a, a tradition or religion you have to practice. God's son, Jesus Christ, lives inside of you. Christianity is personal relationship. And he says, because he does, what does he say there? You have the hope of glory. Because Christ lives in you, you have hope for eternity. A believer can be confident of eternity with Christ in heaven when he or she knows Christ is already in them now. Now look at verse 28 through 29. We're going to go through this. Then we're going to draw truth. You're doing great. Ready? Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. In this verse, and we'll break it down real quick, Paul notes four ways he communicates Christ. He says, number one, preach. Whom we preach. How do I communicate Christ? I preach. What is preaching? What I'm doing right now. To a larger audience, standing before them and preaching the word of God and Christ. And then he says also, warning every man. Warning would be counseling with people to navigate the problems of life. And counseling, by the way, that's centered around God's word. Then he says, teaching. What would be teaching? Instruction. Offering information to help others know the gospel and understand a Christian worldview. And then he says, Present every man perfect. What would that be? Maturing, discipling, helping people understand doctrine so that they're not swayed by every wind of doctrine and they're maturing in their faith. And Paul said, I've sold my life out to communicate Christ in these four areas. Paul both toiled and struggled to care for many believers he served. It was not a part-time effort, but rather something that required all of his energy. Now we go through those verses and we understand what Paul is saying. We understand the context. We could spend a lot of time in each of those verses, but I want to bring to your attention six S's, all right, that I hope would stick with you when I look back at those words. Six S words. Ready? Number one is this. Stand. Stand. Verse 24, if you look back, verse, uh, first part of verse 24, what does he say? Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. Paul suffered many times in his life because he stood for Christ. He did not cower. He did not back down from his faith. In fact, you read Romans chapter 1, and what does Paul say? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to everyone that believeth. 
Billy Sunday was an old evangelist, and many you have probably have heard of him. But he used to tell this story in many of his sermons and way of standing for your faith. He would say there was a profession, uh, professing Christian who got a job in a lumber camp, and that camp that he got the job in had a reputation of being very ungodly. Just nothing to do with God, a lot of cursing, cutting up, dirty jokes. And so a friend hearing that the man had been hired, he said to him, Bro, if those lumberjacks find out that you're a Christian, you're going to be in for a hard time. The man said, I know. I know, I, 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 but I need the job. The next morning, the lumberjack left for camp, and a year later, he came home for a visit. While he was in town, he, he met with his friends, and they asked, well, well how'd it go? Did they give you a hard time because you're a Christian? He said, oh, no, not at all. They didn't give me a bit of trouble, he said. I said, why? Because they never found out. <laughs> and we chuckle to that, and we think, well, you know, that's, it, is, it is comical, but when you peel back the layers of what the message of that story is this, we can't be afraid to tell people we're a believer of Jesus Christ. We can't be afraid to say, yes, I believe in this book. Yes, Jesus Christ is my Savior. Yes, I'm sold out to the Lord. Yes, my life is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. We laugh, but as Christians, so many times we coward our faith and we're guilty, myself, we're guilty of blending in. And again, you've heard me say it doesn't mean go in your workplace and stand on a table, get a Bible and start preaching and yelling at people. But people should see a difference in you. But so many times we're embarrassed and we blend in and we what? We laugh at the dirty jokes. We take the Lord's name in vain. We fly under the radar. And we need believers of Christ, especially today in 2024 America, for the sake of those kids downstairs who are not afraid to stand and share their faith. Show a world that so desperately needs Christ. The difference between the world and a born-again believer of Jesus Christ. Listen, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. We fail every single day. We're sinners like the rest of you. But there's something different in my life because my life is built on Christ. And I'm not afraid to proclaim that. I'm not afraid to tell people that. You know, I think it's... Uh, I'm not going to go there. No, I am going to go there. Represent Jesus Christ. There's a man in the back right there. I don't want to embarrass him. Ulysses, and it's his first time here today. And he shook my hand. He said, and I don't know who it was. It could Brandon drives it. I drive it. Kyle, I don't know. He said, you know why I'm here this morning? He said, I was going through Starbucks a couple months ago, and the church van was in front of me and paid for my coffee. And so I thought, i got to go check that church out. Probably Kyle. He drives all the time, and so does Brandon. But here's the thought. Don't be afraid to represent Jesus Christ and show there's something different about us. We love people, we serve people, and we point people to Jesus Christ. Stand. Number two, we serve. Look at verse 25. He said, Whereof I am made minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Serve. Stand and serve. Paul was a servant of Christ. What does it mean to be a servant of Christ? In ancient times, slaves were purchased or born into a slave family and served the master until they died or until the master decided to free them. Some slaves had developed such a close and loving relationship with the master's family that they wanted to continue serving even when they could go free. And the idea that Paul is saying in this context and in this culture and what he's conveying when he refers himself as a servant of Christ, the Lord has bought us with a high price. And those who come to know him desire to abandon all rights to him and choose to serve him faithfully into their dying breath. A servant of Christ is one who has voluntarily set aside his or her personal rights, his or her agenda in order to love, serve, and obey the will of God in Christ Jesus. A servant of Christ sets aside some requirements that are really universal for anyone who serves Christ, they decide, you know what, I'm going to continue in my faith. I'm going to destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. I'm going to take every thought captive to obey and fight the battle in my mind and fight sin. I'm going to pursue holy living to represent Christ. I'm going to daily crucify the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. I'm going to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm going to store up treasures in heaven and invest in eternity. 
Revelation, Timothy talks about, I'm going to eagerly await the Lord and the Master's return. I'm going to serve and support Christ's church, the local church you're a part of. Give Christ the preeminence of your life, your finances, your desires, your goals. Be a good steward and serve Jesus Christ with your life. Forfeit your rights. Forfeit your agendas. You know, you'll be better off when you stop fighting in your life. Say, fighting with who? Yourself? Your will, your way, your agenda. I know better. I know this. I heard this. Just come to the place where, listen, I don't have all the answers, but I know a God who does, and I'm going to serve him the rest of my life. Paul says, I stand for my faith. I serve. I'm a servant of God. I serve in my faith. I, I serve the church of God. And then number three, I wrote this down, verse 26. He said, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. The gospel is for everybody. I wrote down that I want to serve, but I also wrote down I want to savor, meaning what? I want to rejoice in my salvation. I want to rejoice in the fact that the gospel is for all. Can I encourage you, believer of Christ, never get over your salvation. God is uniting the church for the Jews and the Greek, the Jews and the Gentile, and the gospel is for everybody. And praise the Lord, if it wasn't for everybody, I wouldn't be standing here this morning. Don't let some preacher, don't let some teacher, don't let somebody on the internet or TV tell you that the gospel is for a certain group of people. That a gospel is for these people who are predestined to go to heaven. No, for God so loved the world. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Rejoice in your salvation. I read that this week and I was like, God, thank you that I'm saved. Man, how hopeless and how empty and how dark my life would be without Jesus Christ. No meaning, no purpose, no peace. But because Christ is my life and I put my faith in him, and many of you can attest the same, things have changed. And so I savor. And then I notice this, verse 27a. And again, I, I, I talked about this a moment ago, but to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory. I stand, I serve, I savor. And then I wrote this word down, sovereign. Christ made known the mystery in his timing. The Old Testament prophets were not aware, but God knew. In your life this morning, you might not be aware. You might be caught off guard. You might be worried. Maybe some things have happened this week that was not part of the plan. You were not expecting them to happen. Maybe you're going through a struggle. You're going through something. You're beating yourself up. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, understand there is a sovereign God in heaven who sees and knows and is in control. And he's not caught off by surprise. He's not caught off guard. He's not worried. And Romans 8, 28 tells us that if we love him and we serve him, we put our faith in him, he can take all this stuff in our life that maybe we think is bad and he can make it good. That is the sovereignty of God. Trust in him, in his timing. He's in complete control. Charles Spurgeon said this, the sovereignty of God is a sweet pillow that you can lay your head at night. It's a beautiful truth, not only that God is in control over all, but is also working everything out, the good, the bad, for your good and his glory. This sweet doctrine is medicine for the soul that you can take in any season of life. And you're here this morning, you feel you've lost control. You don't know what else to do. There's a God who's still in complete control. Can I remind you of that this morning? We lose sight of that. God knows. God sees. God's not worried. God's not crying. God's not caught off guard. God's not, why did they do that this week? I wasn't expecting that. How, what am I going to do? No, no, no. There's a God who knows and sees. And he loves you anyways. And he wants to work in your life. He wants to pick you back up. He wants to dust off the dirt. He wants to make you go on your way. He wants to continue to work in your life. He's a sovereign God in his timing. Notice verse 27b, two more and we're done. He says, to whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And then he says, which is Christ in you. I stand, I serve, I savor, sovereignty, I trust. And then verse 27, the second part of that, I seek. Paul makes the gospel message very personal, as I mentioned before, to the believers in the church of Colossae. He said, Christ in you. You've heard me say this many times behind this pulpit. 
but it's not about a religion. It's not about rules. It's not about, well, church is no fun because then I can't do this and I want to do this, but I can't do that. It's not about tradition. It's not about pleasing men. It's not about putting people up on a pedestal. It's not about games or politics or hypocrisy and all the things that we hear the world throw our way. Real Bible Christianity is about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Pastor, why did God make me? Why am I here? What's my purpose? I hear that question often, especially new Christians who are seeking. What am I supposed to do? Why did God create me in the first place? Can I tell you this? God made everybody for two reasons. And you can go back to Genesis, and we won't for sake of time, to glorify him and to fellowship with him. God made you to bring glory to him. God gifted you with unique talents and abilities. There's 7 billion people in the world, but you are unique in your own way. No one is like you. No one matches your exact DNA. No one matches the exact numbers of hair on your head. You are unique to God, and he molded you, and he created you. And the Bible says he knew you when you were in your mother's womb. You were no accident. You were no mistake. And he created you because he loves you. And he created you because... He wants to give you talents and abilities and a life that brings glory back to who it's due, and that's God the Father. And he gave you a life and a heartbeat and a conscience and a mind and a desire to seek him and to fellowship with him and to have a relationship with him. Can I urge you this morning, seek God for yourself. Christ wants to change you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to work in your life. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to lead you. Would you submit your life to him? Would you stop fighting? And would you seek him daily? If you're a believer of Jesus Christ here this morning, can I encourage you every single day, seek the Lord. When you don't feel like it, seek the Lord. When things are rough, seek the Lord. When you can't seem to figure it out, seek the Lord. Every day, seek God with your life. Lastly, verse 28 through 29, stand, serve, savor, sovereignty, trust, seek, and number six, speak. Verse 28 through 29, let's read it as we close. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. I speak. What did Paul do? He proclaimed the gospel message. He knew his role and he served in his role. He desired to reach the lost and encourage believers. Now listen, I know not everybody is going to. We broke that verse down a few moments ago. God has not called everyone to counsel and teach and preach in front of a large crowd. I understand that. But God commands all of us to tell. God commands all of us to be a witness. Let me challenge you with something this morning. On this topic, and we're just, we're just about done. I wonder what our community and our church would look like if every person desired or made the decision to reach one person this year with the gospel of Jesus Christ. One. Our church right now on an average Sunday with the kids and babies and everyone, we have 140, 150 people in the building up here Probably a little over 100. And I wonder if every person here, including myself, said, God, would you use me to reach someone with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Would you use me to make a difference? Would you use me to show the love of Christ to my family member, to my coworker, to my neighbor, to my kid's coach, to my friend, to my kid's teacher? Would you use me to reach somebody? Man, that's the Great Commission. If God could use each and every one of us just to reach one person, our community would be a lot brighter. The gospel would be spreading, and God would continue to work even in a greater way. It's not about building New Heights Baptist Church. Yeah, we track attendance, and we all that, and we want to grow, and I believe the Lord will take us there. But it's, it's bigger than that. There's people in our community that are hurting. There's people in our community that are struggling. I spoke with someone this week whose children were in Sandy Hook 10 years ago. 
survived, but are still dealing with the effects of it. Community is hurting. People are struggling. People are battling depression. People are battling addiction. Spiritual attacks. Satan builds strongholds in communities and builds strongholds in our country and our world. And he doesn't want to let go. By the way, Satan builds strongholds in your life and your family. And can I encourage you, we have a room here with predominantly new Christians. Two years ago, you weren't sitting in church on a Sunday. You weren't reading your Bible. And whether you realize it or not, the spiritual opposition, the devil, and the spiritual beings that are real in the, in the spiritual world, they had a grasp on your family, whether you realize it or not. The Bible says their eyes were blind to the things of God. That was you two years ago, a year ago, six months ago. Do you think that all of a sudden you're going to walk into the doors of church and all of a sudden you're going to decide I'm going to teach my kids the Bible and read the Bible and trust Christ and go to church and everything's just going to be all well and dandy? Do you think the enemy's not going to put up a fight? Of course he is. You think he's not going to come after your family? You think he's not going to get you to slip up? You think he's not going to try to get you, get you down and depressed and discourage you and whisper thoughts in your mind like, you can't do this. You're not good enough. You're trying to be church. You know all your life. You know what you did. You know your baggage. You know your mistakes. You're a hypocrite. You're a joke. Of course he is. You think he's not going to come after our families? You think he's not going to try to cross dissension? You think he's not going to fight back? Of course he is. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God has given us the victory. God will see us through. God will protect. That's why it's important as believers we pray for each other. We pull for each other. We're on the same team. We unite together. We don't compare. We don't, we don't fight. We try to put on a show. We're all people who are hurting, but we have one thing in common, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ gives us hope. And Jesus Christ gives us a new start every day. And there's people in our community, around in Newtown and abroad, that don't know Jesus Christ, and they're looking, and they might smile on the outside, and they might have a nice big house, and they might have a cool car, and their 401k might be doing great, and they might be working up the career ladder, but inside, they're empty, they're broken, there's a void, they're anxious, and they're missing something. And how dare we as believers sit in the pews of this church and think it's not our commission to give them the gospel. Man, if we'd be Apostle Paul, man, he gave his life to go all throughout Asia Minor and Europe to start churches. And I'm not saying drop your job and go start churches. But I am saying, would you ask God to help you reach one? One person. I look at this chapter and I think, I want to stand, I want to serve. I want to savor my salvation. I want to trust in his sovereignty. I want to seek and I want to speak the name of Christ to everybody that I can. And this morning, as we hit on a wide variety of topics, I don't know how the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and if he is at all. But I would encourage you, if you're here, and the Spirit of God is working in your heart and your mind, it's not something spooky, it's not weird, it's not going to hear some audible message. But God's working in your heart. There's a burning there right now. There's a conviction there right now. Would you respond to the conviction of God? Would you respond to the voice of the Holy Spirit? And would you ask the Lord to help you in all of these areas, in one of these areas, so that we can become more like Jesus Christ and grow in our faith?